Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Greetings and welcome to the Quarles and Brady webinar, Accessibility for the Disabled, Combating the Cottage Industry of ADA Lawsuits. My name is Otto Immel. I'm a partner in our labor and employment group, and I head our firm's Florida labor and employment practice. I counsel and represent employers in a wide variety of workplace-related litigation, and also advise on all aspects of labor and employment law. My co-presenter today is Eric Johnson, also a partner in our group. Eric's focus is on employment law counseling and litigation in Arizona, Nevada, and New Mexico state and federal courts. We have a few housekeeping items to go over before we begin the presentation. We will be applying for one hour of continuing legal education credit. If you are an attorney and would like to receive CLE credit for attending today's program, please fill out the CLE form located at the back of the PDF copy of the materials that are found in the handouts panel of the webinar dashboard. Please complete the form and return it to Shona Boyd. Her contact information is listed at the bottom of the document. Additionally, for our webinar participants, uh, we have muted all phone lines for those dialing in and for participants listening to audio via computer. Uh, you will not be able to speak. We are in listen-only mode. We would like you to be aware that this presentation is being recorded. An electronic survey will be emailed to you after the program. If you have a question during the program, please type your question into the Q&A box located in the upper right corner of the webinar dashboard and submit it. The conference host will make sure that the speakers receive the message. And with that, we will turn to the program. Um, <clears throat> our agenda today is to um, cover uh, a little bit about what substance of Title III of the ADA is. Um, we're going to talk about the places where it applies uh, and the people to whom it applies, and then why you should be concerned about ADA Title III claims now. Um, the ADA has been in effect for um, 25 years, but why all of a sudden are we having topics like this? You'll hear why that is. After that, we're going to talk about um, why, uh, what you can do uh, in response to the growing number of lawsuits in the Title III area. Um, we'll talk a little bit about business effort, uh, the government's efforts to help businesses, some best practices, um, and uh, some contractual protections that might uh, be worth looking into. Um, also, we'll talk about what to do if you receive a violation notice for a lawsuit. And finally, we will turn to some common myths and dispel them. Okay, so we're talking about Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, this is the title that applies to public accommodations. Um, the ADA was enacted in 1990 with the um, laudatory goal of leveling the playing field uh, for the members of our country who experience some disability. However, like all well-intentioned legislation, um, it is unfortunately subject to abuse. Um, specifically today, we're going to be talking about um, the restrictions in Title III that prohibit discrimination on the basis of disability in the activities and places of public accommodation. That is businesses that are generally open to the public and that fall into one of 12 categories listed in the ADA, such as uh, uh, restaurants, movie theaters, schools, daycare facilities, recreation facilities, and doctor's office. Uh, the restrictions on discrimination apply both to the new construction or the uh, modification of existing structures um, and uh, have uh, considerable technical guidelines for how things are to be built. Um, and these apply to um, almost everything that is currently out there because the standards went in so long ago. Um, in addition, with regard to existing facilities where there are no construction or modification obligations, um, discrimination also includes the failure to remove architectural barriers. Um, and that is often the um, focus of uh, the lawsuits that are being brought uh, in the last couple of years. So are you, um, is your business a public accommodation? 
Um, the answer is that it probably is. Um, if you are any place uh, where you are operating or leasing to a person who uh, operates a place of public accommodation, right? Again, we're talking about retail, grocery, restaurant, hotels, offices, um, uh, a standalone business, uh, shopping centers, gas stations, um, and the obligations that apply both to landlords and tenants. Um, there are over 5 million private establishments um, that are covered by Title III of the ADA. It also covers commercial facilities um, such as uh, office buildings, factories, and warehouses whose operations affect commerce. Private entities um, that offer certain examinations and courses related to educational and occupational certification, such as private universities, are covered. Private clubs, membership clubs, for example, golf clubs, are not necessarily covered unless that the facilities of the private club are made available to customers or patrons of a place of public accommodation. Um, the, the broadest exclusion is for entities controlled by religious organization, uh, including places of worship, which are not covered at all. Um, so how are those requirements enforced? Uh, well, one way is through the Department of Justice. Uh, the government can enforce the standards of Title III against private businesses. Um, the mechanism for doing so is for the Department of Justice to file a lawsuit in federal court um, in connection with which um, uh, compensatory damages are available uh, if the government wins. Um, DOJ may also seek and obtain civil penalties of up to $75,000 for the first violation and $150,000 for any subsequent violation. But in order to do so, uh, the government has to try to resolve the issue with the party prior to going into court. Um, the Department of Justice can't sue unless the negotiations to settle have failed. Uh, and so that is um, one of the big distinctions that we're going to be seeing between government enforcement and uh, the private civil lawsuit. Now, you may not have read about a lot of government enforcement cases, and frankly, there haven't been a huge number over the years. However, that's not to say that the government won't sue you. Um, in the past year or two, they have been bringing cases against businesses, both large and small. Um, one case that we're going to be talking about involves uh, a newly constructed um, uh, restaurant and bar complex um, in Iowa. Um, following newspaper coverage of the new facility and comments that parts of it were not accept accessible to people in wheelchairs, um, the Department of Justice um, began an enforcement action. Um, the case is the United States versus Craft LLC and 30 Hop LLC. Uh, the uh, uh, restaurant was uh, 30 Hop, and uh, the new facility, uh, as alleged in the government's complaint, um, did not provide an accessible route to the upper level rooftop patio or the basement. It had an inaccessible entrance, had stairs with open risers, no accessible dining tables, and contained inaccessible toilet room elements. Um, and the government uh, moved forward with that case and ultimately obtained a consent decree um, from the defendant business. Uh, the result, um, 17 pages worth of items to be fixed in this um, relatively newly constructed building. The maximum civil penalty, uh, 17,500. Um, compensation for anyone who claim to be aggrieved um, uh, and unable to use the facilities of a fixed amount of 3,500, um, compli compliance enforcement by the government beginning eight months after the consent decree was entered and continue, continuing every eight months after that. And what that involved was a requirement that the uh, business submit detailed photographs showing measurements, architectural plans, and work orders, 
um, that they maintain and describe complaints about accessibility by individuals with disabilities and what they did to respond to each complaint um, and to provide copies of documents related to those compliance efforts. So on top of all of those expenses, the company also had to pay its own attorney's fees in going through that process. Um, obviously, it was a very serious outcome for that business. Um, and uh, for them, uh, it was unfortunate that they were one of the recipients of government action. But the real danger here, and what we have been seeing as an explosion in the last two or three years, are the private causes of action under the ADA. And these um, uh, permit individuals to sue for injunctive relief. Um, and under the federal law, they cannot receive um, compensatory damages, although those damages are available as noted in some states, um, California and New York as just two examples. That is under the state law equivalent of the ADA Title III accessibility laws. Uh, the, the real uh, issue for these is that unlike other forms of discrimination under the ADA, there is no requirement that a plaintiff first exhaust any administrative remedy. So there is no early opportunity to informally address claims and have them resolved. Instead, the plaintiff can go right into court. There's no requirement for pre-suit notice or any administrative proceeding. Um, a lawsuit may be the first business hears if there's any issue at all. Um, this is often a big surprise and frankly sometimes um, new information to the business. Many businesses have no intent uh, or desire to have inaccessible facilities. They believe their facilities are fully compliant. They receive no complaints from any customers um, and all of a sudden they get a lawsuit. Um, where they get a call from the newspaper that they have been sued. Um, so all of a sudden there could be a lawsuit with an obligation to defend as well as a requirement to fix whatever is not compliant. So who are we talking about? Who are the players in this cottage industry out there? Well, the primary ones, the people you read about as the plaintiffs, are testers. These are disabled people who travel around the country looking for businesses uh, that are open to the public and don't comply with the ADA. Um, their sole goal is to find non-compliant businesses and sue them. Um, they do this um, often on road trips where in the space of a day they may visit 20 or 30 different locations of the same business. Uh, we recently resolved a case in Florida where the, the named plaintiff claimed that uh, she wished to visit every one of the 26 supermarkets of that um, supermarket chain that were within about a 40 mile area. Um, and so it's very easy once a few uh, violations are uh, identified to bring uh, large claims against operators of multiple properties. Uh, they also might visit every location in a series of strip malls up and down the highway um, looking for, uh, first of all, common problems in the parking lots. Um, that is a very hot area in terms of the number and location of spaces, the condition of the parking lot, um, and in particular, the slope of the path from the handicapped spaces to the businesses. The reality is, and the unfortunate reality, is that these are not people who are really interested in patronizing those businesses. Um, they are hunting for people to sue in order to make money. Who else is on the team with the tester? Often it's a consultant. Um, these are often people who have some construction background um, and have uh, become familiar with certain aspects of the ADA technical requirements. Um, and they, uh, either alone or with a tester, will visit properties with measuring tapes and uh, incline reading uh, machinery um, and uh, be noting and taking pictures of any non-compliant 
item. Um, a question arises in some of these cases, do these people really have standing? Because they're not really bona fide patrons or people who are denied goods or services. Um, and uh, although some courts are entertaining arguments on the standing issue, um, in the 11th Circuit, for example, here in Florida, um, the actual motive behind the person who's bringing the complaint is not considered relevant um, uh, as long as there is a sufficient allegation and reasonable likelihood of that person returning to a facility. Um, and so uh, the, the um, floodgates are open for people to bring these cases even though they're not um, what is intended to be the protected group of people. And so who else is on this team? Well, you knew this was coming. Attorneys, right? There are lawyers specializing in this area throughout the country who see Title III as a really easy way to make plenty of money. Um, the way these cases so often play out, um, the uh, uh, plaintiff's attorneys um, uh, are, are intent on um, imposing as much pain as possible. Here's a quote I love from Forbes magazine from December. Um, Abusive lawsuits under the Americans with Disabilities Act have spread across the country like an infectious disease, plaguing small and micro businesses. Although California remains patient zero where the disease constantly mutates, small businesses in Florida, Texas, New York, and states in between are now suffering from ADA lawsuit contagion. Um, the way these get presented um, are often with um, burdensome discovery, uh, Rule 34 requests for inspections, um, even though they've already been there with their tester, um, and uh, extensive discovery. Um, and the goal is to, in, to uh, expand the balloon of exposure to you know, maybe $50,000 or more and then present the opportunity to settle it for 10 or 12,000. Um, and for too many small businesses, uh, they, they can't fight the fight. Um, they will give in and uh, pay the plaintiff's attorney 10 or $12,000 for doing virtually nothing. Um, and so that's what makes these profitable. The lead offender in this area in the state of Florida um, is a man named Howard Cohen. Um, he is the most litigious plaintiff in Florida in the last three years. He's followed, filed um, more than a thousand lawsuits against businesses for Title III violations. Um, he's actually a former physician um, who's gone bankrupt twice and describes himself as having numerous disabilities, um, which make it difficult for him to walk. Uh, not surprisingly, there's been some press coverage of him outside his million dollar home in Boca Raton, uh, sweeping the outside of the house and raising the room and et cetera. Um, however, the courts have generally uh, permitted him to continue with his um, onslaught of claims. Um, in 2015, for example, he sued a motel in St. Petersburg, um, alleging that the motel lacked sufficient disabled parking spaces and did not have a pool lift as required by the 2010 amendments to the ADA. Um, the motel actually did fight that. They said that they had the accessible spaces, they just weren't visible in the photos that Cohen took and attached to his complaint, and that they had a portable pool lift that it brings out whenever requested. Um, he then voluntarily dropped the case. Um, the defendants, not satisfied with just that, um, obtain, uh, attempted to obtain their attorney's fees, saying that he had uh, not filed the lawsuit in uh, good faith. And um, although the court expressed doubt about his credibility and acknowledged that the way he pursued his cases was opportunistic, um, they were not willing to find bad faith. Um, and so even in that most egregious of cases where there's not actually anything wrong with a property, and it is an opportunistic serial filer tester plaintiff, um, courts are not willing to impose defendants' attorney's fees on them, um, at least not yet. 
So again, um, federal law permits plaintiffs like Mr. Cohen to be a serial filer of ADA cases. Um, so um, you may be saying, we don't have somebody like that where we are. Um, I haven't read anything about that. We haven't seen it. Um, there's, there's, you know, no, nobody we've heard of has had it. Um, and so you may think that you're safe. Um, but here is a shocking and, and I think disturbing statistic. In the last year, the number of ADA Title III lawsuits has increased by almost 40 percent. Um, so almost 2,000 more cases last year than this year. And the trend so far into 17 um, is, is continuing to accelerate. So how did we get here? Um, you know, brief history, the ADA was passed by Congress back in 1990 with an effective date of 1992. Um, the uh, accessible design standards uh, were promulgated um, at that same time and, uh, you know, comprised uh, 100 or more pages of the um, uh, <clears throat> Code of Federal Regulations and describe in precise detail where and how everything should be uh, designed, built, and installed. Um, the uh, standards were revised by the ADA Access Board rules in 2004, and most recently and significantly, the ADA Standards for Accessible Design were revised in 2010, um, which uh, apply to all new construction and alterations after March 15, 2012. Um, so, again, the ADA Title III requirements uh, impose an obligation to public accommodation operators to make reasonable modifications to their policies, practices, and procedures, uh, unless doing so would fundamentally alter the nature of the goods, services, facilities, um, or accommodations themselves. Um, so that requires both the uh, design and construction, either new construction or alteration, to all be in compliance with the very detailed accessibility guidelines. And it also requires public accommodations who are not engaged in new construction or modification to remove architectural barriers in their existing facilities where doing so is readily achievable. And that takes into consideration um, the resources available to the business um, and the utility of the modification. Um, so by way of example, um, if there is a readily achievable alternative to something that is not readily achievable, then a business could choose to select that. Um, the uh, regulations continue to be updated uh, with new items going into effect as recently as, um, you know, last year. Um, a, the uh, removals, anything being done going forward has to meet the 2010 standard. Uh, the reality of the standards is that they are so precise that very often one of the prime areas for finding violations are in the public restrooms, in retail establishments or restaurants, et cetera. Um, and often these come about because there has been damage to something. There's been damage to the soap dispenser, the paper towel dispenser has been pulled off the wall, one of the grab bars has been pulled off the wall. And the maintenance part of that puts it back. And in order to find a new place in the wall to anchor it, it's an inch higher than it was. And Although that has not resulted in any complaints or any notice, and, and most people you know, can't tell, the testers come in and that thing is an inch out of compliance, which means it might as well not even be there. Um, and so it is very, very easy to find your facilities unintentionally out of compliance. Uh, the problem with what's going on in the last 10 years or so is that none of the changes to the ADA have been uh, for the protection of property owners or business operators. Nothing's been done at the federal level to curb what many people see as an abuse of the ADA by a small number of opportunistic testers and their lawyers um, who are bringing the vast majority of these claims. So the question is, 
what is being done now and what can you do to address this situation? And with that, I will turn it over to Eric. Thank you, Otto, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, the first thing I would like to discuss with you, picking up from where Otto left off, is, well, as he noted, there's currently no federal legislation addressing uh, this issue involving so-called, you know, what are often referred to as drive-by lawsuits. Um, but there has been proposed federal uh, legislation. It has not passed yet, but there are at least a couple things in the pipeline, and I want to just touch on those briefly. Um, the first thing has to do with uh, H.R. Bill 620, referred to as the ADA Education and Reform Act of 2017. This was introduced in the House of Representatives in January of this year. Um, and it's, it proposes, well, I guess several things. Uh, first, uh, it prohibits civil actions regarding the failure to remove architectural, architectural barriers unless one, written notice is provided uh, to the business identifying the barrier, and two, within 60 days, the business fails to provide the person providing notice with a written descri description outlining the improvements uh, that will be made to remove the barrier, or three, uh, the business fails to remove barriers within 120 days of providing the notice uh, about an improvement plan. Um, another term that this proposed bill includes uh, is that the DOJ would be required to develop an educational program for state and local governments, um, as well as property owners, um, to promote effective and efficient strategies uh, for providing access to public accommodations for persons with disabilities. Um, while many business owners are uh, certainly behind this type of proposed legislation, there have been uh, many vo vocal critics uh, of the bill. Um, one of the main critics, or excuse me, one of the main criticisms of the bill is that it arguably shifts the burden of protecting the rights of the disabled to access places of public accommodation onto the disabled, who, in order to uh, you know assert a proper claim under this proposed bill, they would have to you know first. Uh, been denied access to a public accommodation. They then must uh, determine what violations of the law have occurred, um, and then they must provide the business with specific notice identifying which provisions of the law uh, that they believe were violated and when. Um, and then lastly, the agreed person uh, must provide the business with, you know, at least what critics describe as a, you know, an extremely lengthy period of time in order to, to correct the problem, and only after uh, that time has expired, uh, may the uh, aggrieved person file a civil action. Um, another criticism, I guess, that has been levied against you know this type of legislation and others like it is that the uh, ADA was passed approximately 27 years ago. So businesses, at least existing ones, have had 27 years to get into compliance and certainly for new uh, businesses that have been, you know, um, started since the enactment of the ADA, those regulations um, have already been made available, uh, and so there's no excuse, essentially, for businesses to not be in compliance with the ADA. Um, ultimately, I think both of the sides, um, you know, probably have valid and legitimate points and interests, and that is why, you know, I think passing at least some sort of legislation to address these issues, but balance uh, the competing legitimate interests um, is necessary. Um, whether this HR 620 or uh, another bill uh, would would meet that definition, or you know, we're also going to discuss some various state laws that have been enacted in order to address these issues. Um, none of them is a one size fits all, but um, let's discuss a few more of them. The next one is actually another uh, bill that was introduced um, a little a little over two months ago, again in the House of Representatives, and this is uh, H.R. 1493. And this is entitled the ADA Lawsuit Clarification Act of 2017. Uh, this bill is, you know, extremely similar to H.R. 620, except it doesn't contain maybe, you know, as extensive an educational component uh, as H.R. 620, other than it does require the uh, Attorney General uh, to be responsible for putting out publications, uh, making technical assistance, um, you know, and other modifications, you know, guidance uh, to business owners and governments 
which frankly I think the Attorney General's office has already you know put out various publications. Um, this bill has been referred to the Judiciary Committee, or it was referred on March 31st, 2017, and we are now waiting to see what further action, uh, if any, will be taken regarding this bill or HR 620. Moving on to some of the activity that's been going on in states. Um, for Arizona, where, where I'm located, um, while many businesses um, are lobbying for the federal government uh, to take action uh, concerning the threat of uh, potential abuse of public accommodation lawsuits, even if they are successful, uh, in most states, plaintiffs are going to be able to pursue similar claims uh, and or potentially abuse uh, public accommodation claims um, under state law, um, completely separate uh, from the federal ADA. Arizona is one of the states that has seen a lot of activity in this area. And both the Arizona Attorney General and the Arizona Legislature have taken action to try and address uh, any alleged abuses. Under the Arizona, or excuse me, the Arizonans with Disabilities Act, which is essentially the state version of the ADA, damages as well as injunctive relief and attorney's fees are available for plaintiffs uh, who are able to, able to establish violations of the act. As explained by the Attorney General of Arizona, however, in pleadings um, that were filed in the Maricopa County Superior Court in which the Attorney General um, sought to intervene in approximately 1,700 lawsuits that were brought primarily uh, by an organization by the name of Advocates for Indivi Individuals with Disabilities, or AID. Um, According to the AG's office, this organization had filed approximately over 2,000 lawsuits um, alleging violations of Arizona with Disabilities Act, um, and well as, you know, uh, there's, there was usually similar federal ADA claims as well. Um, but those 2,000 lawsuits, um, you know, were uh, brought largely in the last year, or at least the last couple of years. Um, and the uh, Arizona Attorney General's office viewed this as potentially abusive, sought to intervene in those 1,700 lawsuits. It was granted the right to intervene. Um, and then what it did next was it sought to dismiss uh, those 1,700 lawsuits. Notably, you know, because of the sheer number of the lawsuits, um, you know, there were obviously indications that these lawsuits were thrown together quite quickly, um, you know, and without necessarily, um, you know, verification by any certain individuals with disabilities. I mean, in one case, I believe there was the owner of a dirt lot was sued. Um, and the dirt lot, you know, it was never used as a parking lot. Um, and it was unclear why, you know, how that possibly occurred where that was uh, sued as a defendant. Um, also, I believe, you know, there was the same defendant was sued twice in less than a month, you know, with allegations regarding the same type of violations. And, and the same plaintiffs as well. Um, needless to say, the Arizona Attorney General's Office filed a motion to dismiss the lawsuits. And in order to try and get those lawsuits dismissed, it made several arguments. First, it argued uh, that many of the lawsuits did not allege that plaintiffs patronized or attempted to patronize defendants' businesses. In many of the early lawsuits, it argued that uh, one particular disabled individual uh, became aware, in quotation marks, that defendants' parking lots uh, were in some way not in compliance with state or federal law. Uh, later complaints filed by aid alleged that um, it had conducted an investigation regarding noncompliance with state or federal laws and found the uh, alleged violations of those laws. Either way, the AG's office uh, argued that the plaintiffs had failed to allege a particular particularized excuse me injury. Uh, that they had suffered, and they therefore lacked standing. Um, another argument made by the AG's office uh, was that plaintiffs had failed to allege any barriers to their actual access of public accommodations. In particular, plaintiffs assumed that uh, every instance of noncompliance with state or federal law, no matter how minor, represented a barrier denying access to anyone with a disability. An example of the barriers alleged by plaintiffs uh, included things involving signage for handicapped parking spots that, you know, one, had a bottom edge less than 60 inches off the ground, two, lacked a van ac accessible placard, or three, lacked the uh, international accessibility symbol. Uh, 
the AG's office argued that uh, what was not included in the allegations in these complaints were claims as to how these particular violations actually or could potentially injure plaintiffs, especially when they were at a facility that plaintiffs had never even been to um, or had ever attempted to patronize. Um, further, not all of these barriers denied access to all persons with disabilities. A sign that is one inch too short may still be clearly visible to persons with disabilities. Um, as such, mere noncompliance does not necessarily mean that a disabled individual uh, has been harmed and suffered an injury. Um, along these same lines, the, the Arizona Attorney General next argued that plaintiffs had failed to specify the particular disability at issue and the way in which the alleged barriers uh, prevent equal access to those disabled individuals. For instance, um, you know, an individual with no vision related disability would be hard pressed to establish standing for the failure of a defendant to provide materials um, you know, in Braille um, or that were otherwise accessible um, for that particular disability. Um, finally, um, plaintiffs, um, or excuse me, well, yes, plaintiffs aid as well as the individual defendants in these lawsuits argued that they were deterred from patronizing defendants' businesses, even though they had never intended or desired to patronize those businesses, um, nor did they notify those businesses of potential violations um, or fail to explain why they were actually deterred uh, from potentially patronizing those businesses. All right, in early March of 2017, um, the Arizona Attorney General's office, office's motion to dismiss was granted. But the court did not provide a great deal of specificity regarding the basis for the granting of the motion. It did note that plaintiffs had failed to properly allege uh, in the complaint any distinct and palpable injury, which is you know, obviously the, the basis for those four points that I just discussed. Uh, while this was a, a blow to plaintiffs, this was not certainly not a fatal blow. Um, and that to the extent you know future plaintiffs are bringing lawsuits under either the, the, the state law or the federal law, um, certainly they can use this as an example and make sure that they have suffered and they've alleged a distinct and palpable injury. Um, if so, those certainly could be valid claims um, and very well might entitle those plaintiffs uh, to injunctive or monetary relief, at least under state law. But the courts in Arizona, you know, are, are not the only body that has, has tried to address this issue. The legislator, legislature has also uh, gotten involved. Specifically on, well, actually it was earlier this month, I think it was May 3rd, 2017, an amendment to the Arizonans with Disabilities Act was signed, uh, wherein plaintiffs will now have to notify uh, potential defendants of violations of the Arizonans with Disabilities Act and provide 30 to 90 days uh, in order for the business to cure um, any of those violations. And the, the varying scale in terms of the 30, 90 days, that's based in large part based upon what remedial measures need to be taken. Um, while this was viewed as a success for many businesses in the state, as I just mentioned, uh, this does not prevent plaintiffs from asserting claims uh, under the act, um, nor uh, were they have suffered you know, a direct injury, nor does it um, impact in any way their, their ability to bring a federal ADA claim in Arizona state or federal court. You know, it should be pointed out, I guess, however, that, you know, defendants um, in federal court, you know, even though um, the federal claims aren't directly impacted by you know, the Attorney General's office motion to dismiss with, re with respect to the state law, um, defendants in lawsuits in Arizona and, frankly, in, in various other states um, can use some of the arguments that the Arizona Attorney General's office has used um, to try to defend themselves against uh, these types of claims. One, you know, I know at least in Arizona, one strategy that I have seen, um, I, at least with some success, with respect to lawsuits brought in federal court is that which, you know, for federal court, they can only seek injunctive relief, not monetary damages. Um, 
for those claims, as soon as the defendant is filed, if they go ahead and take remedial measures and cure any violations of the federal ADA, at that point they may be in a position to file a motion to dismiss the complaint as moot because the injunctive relief sought, which is essentially to become in compliance with the ADA, has already been done. Um, I'm aware of at least some anecdotal stories that that has been um, approved by at least one judge. Um, in that situation, certainly that's an easy method to get rid of the lawsuit, um, but there's still a question whether or not the plaintiffs would be entitled uh, to any attorney's fees um, in such a case. But that's something that uh, I think we're going to probably see it more of in the future. Um, you know, one thing that has happened since Arizona has been really focused on this issue in both the courts and through legislation um, is, uh, from uh, at least according to media reports, aid and some other individuals who are, you know, sometimes called as serial filers um, have apparently, you know, gone out outside of Arizona to try their you know, their luck at, in different states, such as Colorado, New Mexico, and Nevada. You know, in those states, I, I know several of those states are already looking at, at these same issues, and I would not be surprised if those states, as well as various others, um, adopt some sort of legislation to try to address this issue. As uh, Otto mentioned earlier, I think he mentioned a quote from Forbes magazine that said California was essentially ground zero with respect to these types of cases. Um, and, it, you know, that's accurate, I think, and it, it's for good reason. The vast majority of the lawsuits um, that really arose, at least early on, um, came out of California. And California has taken various measures to try and address the, the potential abuse of these claims while balancing uh, you know, the rights of disabled individuals to have access to public accommodations. Notably, California, like several other states, allows damages for violations of state disability laws. And I think it was mentioned in a prior slide um, that I believe it was $4,000 per violation in California. So needless to say, um, if a business has a number of violations, um, you know, the, the penalties could, could add up quite quickly and could lead to a significant uh, amount of damages. Um, the California legislature, they have um, taken note of this issue and they have passed various pieces of litigation to try and place at least some limits on these claims. Um, and many of these new laws, though, uh, they seem to have really been focused on the smaller companies or businesses, not the large national or international companies. Um, for instance, um, under California law for companies with under 25 employees, they are subject to a rebuttable presumption that a plaintiff has not suffered damages for a technical violation uh, you know, of the state law that is corrected within 15 days of notice of the violation. Um, another provision uh, provides that employees with less than 50 employees may be able to limit their liability when they obtain an evaluation from a certified access specialist. That's a you know, defined term and role uh, for someone uh, that has certain qualifications in California. Um, and if they go ahead and make the necessary repairs within 120 days, they can help to limit uh, damages or liability. Before filing a lawsuit in California, demand letters uh, should be sent identifying deficiencies uh, and containing certain certain other pieces of information um, that's specified in California law. I won't go into those because unless you're in California, um, it's probably not relevant here. But um, also in California, when a complaint is filed, it must be verified uh, by the plaintiff and must also be served along with certain written advisories regarding uh, a stay of the litigation so that an early evaluation conference can take place and there can be discussions uh, concerning what conditions or actions that, that could be taken in the near future in order to potentially reduce the amount of at least statutory damages. Another state um, that has also tried to enact legislation to address potential abuses of you know, public accommodation lawsuits uh, is Minnesota. Um, specifically, Minnesota law provides that businesses should be provided with pre-suit demand letters and given a reasonable time period of at least 30 days in order 
to make the appropriate repairs. This is not required by law when a plaintiff, um, or excuse me, uh, when filing a complaint, um, but a defendant will be able to assert an affirmative defense if those requirements or prerequisites, prerequisites were not met. Um, the legislation, at least in Minnesota, has received you know, criticism, uh, frankly, from both sides. Many businesses argue that the law does not go far enough, while disability advocates have argued that the law is too favorable to businesses. Um, it's my understanding that there are some current efforts to pass new legislation in Minnesota that will provide um, you know, some new protections and, and requirements. Um, whether or not that is going to pass and what the final version of any such legislation would look like, uh, that's going to be remain to be seen. Um, but we will certainly be keeping an eye on it. Um, the last kind of state I just want to mention is with respect to Florida. Um, Florida is obviously a very large state and like California has seen a lot of activity concerning public accommodation cases from you know very early on. As such, you know it's not surprising that even as far back as uh, 2013 there were at least some efforts made to try to enact legislation to address these issues. Um, uh, at the time, Florida Representative Kathy Castor introduced a bill which would have provided businesses with a 90-day period to cure violations. Um, another Florida uh, representative, Gail Harrell, which interestingly, Representative Harrell was heavily involved with disability rights and, and advocacy for those rights, um, actually uh, supported a bill with a 120-day cure period. The legislation, however, did not pass, um, but that's, that, that's not the end of the story. There has been other efforts made in Florida to enact new legislation. Um, specifically, uh, earlier this month, a safe har harbor bill was passed and is now awaiting the governor's signature. The bill allows owner of places of public accommodation uh, to hire a qualified ADA expert and submit a certification of conformity for the uh, state or with excuse me to the state, showing that the facility is ADA compliant. Um, the certification is good for a period of three years. Um, if it is not ADA compliant. Um, a reme remediation plan can be filed with the state specifying the time period by which the, plan, uh, excuse me, the place of public accommodation will be brought into compliance with Title III. Um, the reasonable time period uh, for remediation um, in a plan cannot exceed 10 years, which is obviously uh, quite a long time. Um, okay, the owner of a business um, can file either the cert uh, excuse me, the Certificate of Conformity or Remediation Plan with the state, such a filing uh, would serve notice to the public that it is in compliance with Title III or making reasonable efforts to get into compliance. The state will develop a publicly accessible website containing electronic registry or certification of conformity and remediation plans. If a plaintiff pursues a lawsuit against a public accommodation which has gone through the process, uh, the courts are directed to consider the remediation plan or cert certification of conformity when determining if the lawsuit was filed in good faith and if the plaintiff is entitled to attorney's fees. Uh, the law, once signed uh, by the governor, is set to take effect July 1st, 2017. Um, we will certainly keep our eye on this in that it's a different statutory framework than some of the other states we've talked about as well as the proposed federal legislation. So it will be interesting to see if this potentially strikes a, a medium between the business uh, interests as well as those of disabled individuals who have the right to access public accommodations. Okay, so what can you do as a business um, moving forward here in order to make sure you are in compliance and in order to try and avoid lawsuits? Um, probably uh, the, the easiest and quickest way to make sure you're in compliance is to hire you know, an ADA compliance expert, um, an expert familiar with both state and federal uh, regulations um, can inspect your facilities and identify issues and provide an outline of what needs to be done in order to become ADA compliant. 
Um, while it might work to reduce or minimize liability by engaging a compliance expert once a lawsuit has been filed against you, particularly for some businesses such as small companies in California like we discussed, um, obviously to the extent a business can be proactive and take actions uh, to become ADA compliant before potential plaintiffs um, identify noncompliance in the form of a lawsuit, uh, this will help ensure that the business will never even get sued in the first place. So obviously, uh, you know, if possible um, to get into compliance, we certainly would advise uh, doing so, um, and then you can minimize the risk of any litigation later down the road. You don't want to be indifferent to ADA issues. Remember, one of the uh, criticisms of the disability advocates uh, regarding you know, current or pending legislation is that um, businesses and companies have had over 27 years to get into compliance. You know, and one thing I think to, to also be aware of, um, you know, on this slide it mentions an angry customer. These lawsuits, as, as obviously you all know, have, have been in the lawsuit, or excuse me, have been in the media and have gotten substantial media attention for some time now. And I've certainly heard at least anecdotal stories of situations where a business owner, you know, has had a disgruntled or angry customer, and that customer has either made complaints to the state um, regarding, uh, you know, public accommodation issues, even if that customer was not disabled. Um, and I've heard at least one story of someone contacting a plaintiff's attorney to give them a heads up um, that they might want to consider suing uh, the business due to noncompliance. Okay, so what are some of the, the main issues that you should be concerned with in determining whether or not you're compliant uh, with state and federal law, and when do you need to engage uh, an ADA expert? Uh, the first place to start you know, is, is probably what really started it all, and that those are a park, you know, parking lot. Um, do you have sufficient handicapped parking spaces? Uh, do you have sufficient van accessible spaces? Um, is the signage correct and at the right height? Um, are there slip or fall hazards or other potential barriers located in or around the parking lot? I mean, if your answer, you know, if you have any of those issues, then certainly you should take action as soon as possible in order to correct, to correct those. Um, the next area you want to check uh, is probably the entranceways to your facilities. Um, can a wheelchair fit through the door unimpeded. Can patrons open the door automatically, or do they need to manually open the door? If the latter, um, how heavy is the door? Uh, you know, is is a disabled individual going to be able to to push it or pull it uh, in order to get in? Do you have signage, um, you know, regarding pets? Uh, if so, or if you're excluding pets from your facilities, you need to accept from that exclusion uh, dogs or other service animals. Okay, turning now to more inside of your facility, um, a common violation for many businesses uh, is that their counters are not the right height. Um, is the point of sale machinery, or POS, and that's you know, something like a credit card reader, is that at the right height and accessible to disabled individuals? Um, can someone in a wheelchair access your counter in order to, to write a check? Those are all potential violations of the ADA if the disabled person isn't able to do those things. All right, aisles and navigation. <laughs> Excuse me. In determining whether your facility is accessible to those, you know, and I guess the most obvious example is a wheelchair, or for anyone else using some sort of assisted mo mobility, you know, uh, device, um, are they able to move and navigate through the aisles of your building um, if not, then there's potentially ADA issues there. Signs, do you have the appropriate signage at your facility um, at around uh, restrooms, exits, elevators? Those are all places where you're going to need signage 
um, note that some signs um, you know might need to be accessible um, you know for let's say for here uh, for excuse me visually impaired people um, there's going to be some braille requirements for some signs okay well parking lot laws you know have been the main source of public accommodation lawsuits you know another common area that is often the subject of these types of lawsuits is the restroom. Um, having just one public restroom at your facility that is compliant, um, that's not enough. All of the public uh, restrooms must be compliant. One common violation you'll see with the restrooms is that the pipes under the sink often are not wrapped or insulated and this creates potential burn exposure. Um, you know, there's countless businesses that do not comply with that provision and it's an extremely easy fix, but if you don't take care of it, there's at least a chance you could get sued for something minor like that and then be, you know, subject to, to receiving quite substantial settlement demands. Um, you know, are the, in the restroom, are the grab bars, um, you know, by a handicapped accessible, excuse me, by a handicapped individual, um, are they the correct length or height? Um, you know, all those various things um, you need to check in order to determine whether you're compliant with state and federal law. Okay. All right, note that, you know, because restrooms are typically quite small, this can make compliance, you know, sometimes very difficult. And sometimes bringing a restroom into compliance uh, is frankly just not readily achievable. And that's a, a term of art when determining whether modifications are readily, excuse me, readily achievable, uh, one must consider the size, type, and overall financial, or excuse me, overall finances of the public accommodation and the nature and cost uh, of the access improvements needed. Note that barrier removal that is difficult now may be achievable uh, in the future as finances change. So for instance, if you're a small mom and pop, um, while certain modifications might not have been readily achievable or would have potentially, you know, cost you an, or an undue burden, um, as the business grows, um, you need to reevaluate because that certainly may not be the case anymore. You know, I've mentioned some of the various issues with respect to parking lots, um, restrooms, um, and some various and entryways. What I would recommend is there is something put out by the Department of Justice. Um, and it is an ADA checklist, and it goes over numerous issues and violations. And that checklist website, you can download it at www.adachecklist.org. All right, just we're running out of time, so I just want to mention a couple things. Um, you know, con contractual protections. There is some support um, with respect to lease negotiations that allow landlord and tenants uh, to come to an agreement as to who is going to be responsible for certain public accommodations. For instance, the tenant might require that the landlord be responsible. However, even if they come to an agreement on that issue, uh, if the landlord and tenant are sued, both of them are potentially liable, or excuse me, are, are potentially liable uh, for failing to provide public accommodation. However, in that situation, the if the uh, tenant is found liable and has to pay anything, it can seek indemnification from the landlord. That is a unique situation. Um, in other contracts, including construction contracts, there's, are, there are at least some cases that argue that you cannot put that type of a provision in a particular contract. Um, the argument is, well, if you're building a contract and you place all the, the liability on the construction company, what um, you know, what motivation does that business then have in order to comply with the ADA if they just have to wait until they're found to be non-compliant and then they get indemnification from the construction company? So for that reason, courts are really scrutinizing those provisions. I mean, I would still at a minimum want to include in any of those types of contracts um, representations made by the construction company or whoever the expert, you know, compliance uh, individual you have is that that says they're representing that they are going to you know provide advice or services that are in compliant with federal and state laws but whether or not that's going to be sufficient uh, to insulate the business 
uh, from being liable for failure uh, to provide a public accommodation? That's a much trickier question. Um, you know, I've got, just to, to, to wrap up, um, you know, there's a couple myths. My building was built before the ADA was enacted. We were grandfathered in. Uh, no, that's not true. I mean, certainly there might be a situation where um, an older building is not able to readily achieve a certain modifications in order to be a, become compliant. In that situation, it may not be necessary, at least at that time, for the, the business to do that. But otherwise, certainly all new uh, businesses, um, and this also involves making alterations or modifications to old buildings. In those situations, you do need to be ADA compliant. Um, myth, the facility passed inspection with local building officials, uh, so we must be ADA compliant. That's absolutely false because, as we've discussed, state, state law often provides different regulations. Um, you know, I think it's we've got two pictures of, you know, handicapped individual accessible there. One is um, the federal one, but I, and I believe the other one is a state law. Um, and one or the other doesn't, they're not interchangeable. Um, at least the state one might not be in compliance with federal law. Myth, I don't need to do anything until I get a notice of non-compliance. Um, maybe that's true now in some states based on the legislation, but certainly under federal law, uh, that is not the case. I see we have just a couple questions. We're unfortunately out of time, um, but I would certainly, uh, so I can't address those right now, but uh, definitely please email myself or Otto with any questions. And for those questions, um, that have been sent, um, either Otto or myself will we'll respond to those uh, in the very near future. Thank you for everyone attending, and certainly please email or contact me if you have any questions or would like to discuss further. Thank you.